up dudes algebra 2 class let's doing we're doing um kind of a makeup class here and we're gonna basically um be hanging out hey i wanted to talk to you guys about a little bit of a revisement of the schedule I, i've had to revise our labs a lot and one of the are the, the labs for all of my classes because um because things are starting to conflict and so i had to adjust our schedule a little bit for algebra class so I wanted to ask you guys if this would be all right. Um, actually, I, I'm not going to ask. I'm basically going to tell you this is what's going down, and then you guys are going to have to be all right with that, hopefully. Um, instead of having, you know how I have like a, a one class on Monday, and then it's almost like a double class on Wednesdays? Yeah. Um, I think what I'm going to do is... I'm going to have only single classes, so I'm only going to have like 45-minute classes, but I'm going to have one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and one on Friday. So I'll still have the same amount of time as far as interactions go with you guys. I'll just have it, you know, a little bit more spread out. And my reason, okay, so here's the time on Friday. The time on Friday is this time right now, 1.30 to 2.15. There we go. So on Monday, it's 1.30 to 2.15. On Fridays, it's 1.30 to 2.15. On Wednesdays, it's 12.45 to 1.30, I think. Yeah. Let me just double check that. On Wednesdays, it's 12.45 to 1.25. Yeah. So I'm going to finish a little bit. Later. All right. The reason, the reason why I'm doing this is because... And, and it's actually... Um, Bradley, do you remember Wednesday's last quarter when you had chemistry, right? And we would do full on like almost like two hours of math and then two hours of, of chemistry. And, and, and I'll tell you what, that sucks. I mean, it sucks for you. I'm sure it sucks for you. It was the worst to eat. Yeah, exactly. And I have a lot of my students who are in physics and they're, they're in the same situation. Obviously, you're not in that anymore because chemistry class ended. But my physics students have me for algebra two and me for physics. And so instead of wanting to, instead of burning them on Wednesdays when they had a, a physics lab, what I basically did was I said, all right, well, I'm going to take one of those hours from algebra two and I'm going to move it to a Friday. And that way, the students who, who have me for algebra and physics on Wednesdays when we have lab, they don't need to come in for four hours. They only need to come in for three hours. All right, so I'm, I'm kind of adjusting that to, to kind of keep those other people in mind. And I'm, I know that you can be sympathetic with that, Bradley, because you actually went through that with chemistry. And I realize I burned you guys at both ends. Are we cool with that? So I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys an email. I was actually constructing an email right as we, we started the class, but then uh, I didn't have a chance to finish it. I'll send you guys out an email letting you guys know the time changes and all of that kind of stuff. Basically, three days a week. On Mondays and Fridays, it's 1.30 to 2.15, just like it's always been. On Wednesdays, it is um, 12.45 to 1.30. So that way, I'm actually going to take my physics class and move them up a little bit of time. Cool? All right, let's get this party started. Can you see this? I'm gonna write hello. Hello. Is that good? Wait, somebody wrote something and I couldn't can't I couldn't see it because somebody chatted it and I couldn't see what they wrote. Someone wrote typed it. Alright. I might miss because I planned a trip to California on Friday. And then we can Oh yeah yeah yeah. Um if, if, if you have a trip, then you have a trip, you know what I mean? Don't worry, Bradley, I'm recording all of these sessions, so we're good, all right? All right, so check this out. Um, we're going to cover rational functions, too. Uh, the class on Friday of next week will be, um, will, be, will be the same time as right now, 1.30 to 2.15. So every Friday, it's 1.30 to 2.15. Just like every Monday, it's 1 through 2 15. All right, ready? We're covering rat two. 
And they gave you this cute little story about a fox, or not a fox, but the hare and the tortoise and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, that was cool and everything, whatever. But essentially, and, they, and, and they're, we're going pretty slowly through this thing, but I think that you guys were, are able to figure this thing out. What we're really going to be interested in is this thing right here. Um, f of x is equal to 1 over x. So f of x equals 1 over x. I'll tell you what, plug that into Desmos for me. Open up a new tab, type in 1 over x for Desmos, and I'll, I'll show you what you get. Actually, you know what, before you plug it into Desmos, let's, let's talk about this thing before. Let's make a little table, okay? And then on this table, I have an x and my y's. So if I have x equals negative 3, what is y equal to? If x is negative 1, yeah, negative 0 0.3, very good. So it's negative 1 third, also known as negative 0.333, whatever. Are we cool? All right. Um, Jenna, I, I love what you're saying there, and it's not exactly a parabola. It's a different shape, um, but it's, it's, it's very similar to, it's kind of like a parabola. It kind of looks like a parabola. I, I can see where you're getting that. Um, what about negative 2? What is that equal to? Negative 0.5. Very good. It's negative 1 half, which is equal to negative 0.5. All right, and then negative 1, what is that equal to? If x equals negative 1, what is that? Okay, that's equal to negative 1 over 1, which is also known as 1. And then I'm going to make a little, a funky little break right here, and then I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go 1, 2, and 3, and then I'm, without much motivation, I'm just going to say, okay, well, this is 1.5 and 0.333. Are we cool with that? Yeah, I just made a table for this f of x. Now, when we're when we graph this, okay, we don't really need to plot points to graph it, but just think about this because this is really important for us to think about. If this were y and this were x, as x, all right. So let's graph the first few ones. At x equals one, I got one. At x equals Two, I got half. At x equals three, I got a third. At x equals four, I'm going to get a quarter. At x equals five, I'm going to get one fifth. At x equals one million, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a really small number, right? Like way out here, it's going to get really close to this x-axis. You guys see that? All right. No, it's not going to be zero, but maybe your calculator will show you 0 0.00001 or something like that. And then maybe you could round that off to zero, but you're right. It will never actually be zero. All right. And then the same goes for the negative side. At negative one, it was negative one. At negative two, it was negative half. And then you know, the graph looks almost uh, symmetric, right? By symmetric, I mean it looks the same on the right and the left, but it's not exactly. It's, it's almost like duplicated this way and then flipped upside down, right? Now, as we get to really, really, so like for x getting to be really big numbers, the y becomes really uh, small numbers, right? Now, what if x were really small numbers? Like, let's try, let's try this again. I'm going to keep adding to my table. Let's try um, negative 10. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Not negative 10. How's about negative 0.1? What is y equal to in negative 0.1? It's equal to negative 10. What about negative 0.01? Negative 100. Okay, good. So as I get closer and closer at, at negative 1 tenth, it's at negative 10. And at negative 100, it's way down here. So as I get closer and closer, it's going to shoot down 
right there. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, uh, without much motivation, I'm just going to say over here it shoots up. Over here. As you get x to be really, really small, um, as you make x really, really small, these y values get really, really big. But here's the problem, of course, is can we ever have, and you notice how when I had my table, I made a little jump. The jump was for this guy right here. What's this? It's undefined. It's, I don't know. And that's kind of the point that we're trying to get here. Is you can't divide anything by zero. Right? I think we talked about that before. Did we, did we once talk about that before? Dividing by zero? Yeah, we talked about the thing exploding and all of that kind of stuff. It would be really bad and hard to divide by zero. You can't divide by zero, so that's a problem. So what we have at x equals zero is this thing that we call a vertical asymptote. Okay? Did I talk to you guys about asymptotes before? I can't remember. Oh, okay, asymptote, all right. It's, it, see this vertical asymptote? It's kind of like this barrier, all right? Now, um, I think that I told you guys this story about one time my son was in really bad trouble and he, he got in a lot of trouble. And so what I did was I made him have his punishment. I said, here's your punishment. Um, all you have to do to get out of timeout is to walk through the door. So here he is, and here's the door. And what I did was um, I said, well, in order to get out of timeout, you have to walk through the door. So what you have to do is you have to go, say that you're 10 feet away from the door, and you have to go halfway. All right, so he went halfway. You have to go halfway again, so he went two and a half feet now. You have to go halfway again, so he went one and a quarter feet away. And then you have to ha go halfway and halfway and halfway. The thing is, will he ever get out the door? Technically, will he ever leave the door? No, he will never will. Because even if he's like one inch away, well, he's going to have to go half an inch away, and then a quarter of an inch, and then a third of an inch, or I mean uh, an eighth of an inch, and so on and so forth, and blah, 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 blah. Even if he's, even if he's one darn particle away, like I am one uh, atom away from the door, then I'm going to go half distance of an atom. You'll never actually get there. Well, that's what an asymptote is. See this vertical line? It's kind of like this thing where, see this graph? It gets closer and closer to that line. And as you get closer and closer to here, it looks more and more like that line. The problem is it never touches it. It just keeps on getting closer and closer and closer, but it never actually ends up getting there. What if x were zero? Okay. Would it touch it then? All right, well, here, here's what I'm saying, all right? Let's talk about x equals zero real quick, because that's actually a pretty cool one. I'm telling you that x cannot equal zero. And I think that the one way that I can say that is, um, what is, this is a one piece of paper, got it? So this is one piece of paper. I'm gonna rip it in half. Well, that's not exactly half. Let's so say, this is half. How many halves can fit in this piece of, it, it, or how many halves does it take to make up one piece of paper? Two. Very good. Exactly. So at x equal one half, y will equal two. All right. What about a quarter size? This is a quarter size piece of paper. How many quarters does it take for to make up one piece of paper? If I'm, yes, exactly. If I made four of these and I, I put them all together, it would equal one piece of paper. Got it? But this is at zero. This is only a quarter. I'm not small enough yet. Let's say that this is a 32nd right here, or 64th. This is a 64th size piece of paper. How many 64th size piece of paper would it take for me to reconstruct a full sheet of paper? 64 pieces. Very good. But this is not zero yet. This is still too big. Okay, okay, so you ready? There. I have a fiber of paper. 
I don't know if you could see it on the camera. How many fibers of paper does it take to make, to reconstruct a, my piece of paper? A lot. Yeah, exactly. Some ridiculous number. Uku plenty. All right. But that's not zero. Okay, you ready? I'm gonna, this is magic, ready? All right, I, I, I've, I got one particle of paper on my fingernail. Like just a single particle of paper. How many particles does it take? An even bigger number than what Bradley said in the first place, right? So, but that's not zero yet. So, so Bradley, do you understand that we can't ever get to zero because the y value will always get bigger. Wait, wait, are you guys, you guys can see my camera, right? You guys can see my face? All right. I'm not sure what's going on, Michael. I'm sorry, Micah. Is it Micah or Michael? I, I couldn't see. All right. Micaiah. Sorry. All right. So do you understand kind of where I'm going? And if it were zero, it wouldn't work because yes, exactly, exactly. I have no particles of paper on my fingertip tip. How many of those do I need in order to make one full sheet of paper? That's essentially what you're asking me. And the answer is you can't, it's impossible. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? So that's, that's what I'm saying. You can't have zero, that is not, that is not in the domain, my friend, which is actually the point of what we're getting at here. Today, all we're going to talk about is really the domain. What is the domain of 1 over x? I told you f, the, the graph of this is f of x equals 1 over x. What's the domain? Well, the domain is this. Yeah, exactly, Jenna. So if f of x were 1 over x, my domain, which I'm going to call a capital D, is x is not equal to 0. So you can have any x value as long as you have an x value where x is not equal to 0. Can you have x equals 0 0.00000000001? Of course you can, but you can't have x equals 0. You guys got it? Okay. So, that's the point of this whole game that we're playing. Let me show you a few more, more things. Here we go. All right, let's try this one. F of x equals 1 over x minus 2. Now, I want you to graph this in Desmos, and I'll wait, but I want you to tell me, what is the domain of this using Desmos? So you open up Desmos, type in f of x equals 1 divided by parentheses x minus 2, and then tell me what is x allowed to be? Everything except two. Exactly. Jenna, I'm assuming that you that you got a graph that looks something like this. Is that correct? Now, one of the things you didn't get is, I bet you on your graph, you didn't get a dotted line going up and down at x equals two. But we know that to be the vertical asymptote, and so in our heads we think of that, in, you know, but it's not necessarily, it wasn't there when you graphed it, I'm assuming. We cool? In fact, remember when I taught you guys how to find the domain of something? Basically, if you have a fraction, you say, okay, well, x minus 2, the stuff in the denominator cannot equal to 0. So what is the domain of this? You just circle the stuff on the bottom, say, can't equal to zero. Big problem, if it equals zero. All right, x cannot equal to two. Are we cool? All right. 
let's test out your brain a little bit. What about this? I'm just going to make one up. What about um, f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 3? What is the domain? You don't even need to use Desmos at this point. Oh, Lucas already got it. It's negative 3. There we go. This is, this is almost kind of like finding the zeros of a function, right? But what we're doing is we're finding the, uh, the problems of the function. This is like everything is all cool and copacetic until you get to x is equal to 3. That's a problem. x cannot equal to 3. So the way you define, write that is you say x can't equal 3. Are we cool with that? Awesome. This actually isn't so bad. All right, let's try this one right here. Oh, okay, this one's a good one. 1 over x squared. What does that graph look like? And I, 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 let's logic our way through it. If, I'll, I'll tell you what. Why don't you guys look it up on Desmos? I'm going to try to figure it out. And then let's see if my ma graph matches the Desmos graph. We cool? Here's what my thoughts are. This is the regular 1 over x. Okay? Now, if I'm squaring something, it's going to take all the things that are negative and make them positive. You guys see that logic? It's going to take all these y values that are negative and make them positive because I'm taking x squared. So negative 3 squared is actually 1 over 9, 1 over positive 9, right? If x were negative 3, y would equal 1 over 9. So this graph gets flipped up. This part gets flipped up. That's what I'm thinking. We cool? But the difference is, I think that um, this graph is going to be a little bit steeper. It's going to be a little bit more steeper than the other graph because of the square part. It kind of amplifies the effects. So I'm thinking that that's the graph. Am I right? Awesome. Okay. And then what is, is there a problem? Is there X, is X, is there an X that um, this function is not allowed to be? Is there a domain issue here? You know, just, yeah. All right. What's up? I have to leave it. Too That's cool. Don't maybe, worry about it. Maybe Monday. Whenever you can. Okay. All right. So, yeah, exactly. Jenna. Um, there's a domain issue here. It it's, doesn't look like this domain issue right here, like that, but it still is an asymptote. You can't have x equal to 0 itself, because if x were equal to 0, that would make this thing a problem again. Are we cool? All right, cool. I'll be honest with you, that's pretty much chapter two. That is pretty much what we have covered for chapter two. Um, oh, is zero squared one or zero? No, zero squared is zero. Because basically you're asking me, what is zero times zero? Oh, that's zero, buddy. I'll be honest with you, that's pretty much all of chapter two right there. And I think that's awesome. Let me ask you this. If I had 1 over, oh, okay, here's a good question. Here's a good question. How's about this? f of x is equal to 1 over x. Got it? There's my, there's my question. All right. All right. f of x equals 1 over x. g of x is equal to 3 over x. Okay? 
I'll tell you what the graph of f of x looks like. It looks like this. What do you think the graph of g of x looks like? You're going to find this to be familiar. Would 3 of x be wider? Hmm. I, I, I think I see where you're coming from, Jenna. I think that what you're kind of getting at here is, well, you're asking yourself, well, what's the difference between f of x and g of x, right? And and you're saying, oh, the threes, the three, that's the difference. It, it, it's almost like I could write this like this, three times one over x, right? And then, and then what you, you're thinking is, hey, wait a second. This is that darn gummy bear thing that Mr. Dalde is like, he's the gummy bear dude, right? And you guys remember what I you guys understand what I mean by gummy bears? Or some of you guys are like, I don't understand what you're talking about at all. You've only talked about it like five times a day. Alright. Well, this three here, what does it do to the graph? If this were just like a parabola. I don't want to say make it wider. I always hate thinking of things going horizontally. What does that three do? Come on, you guys. Chat back with me. Tell me what's going on. Okay. It stretches because it's a number bigger than one. So it vertically stretches this graph. Exactly. So what's going to happen is I believe that it's going to take this thing and it's going to make it be kind of like this. So it's going to take this graph, this original f of x, the dotted one, and it's going to pull it like that, like a gummy bear being stretched out. Are we cool? What do you think will happen? I got a question, another question for you. I got another question for you. What, what about this? What if I did 0.25 in front of there? What will happen to the graph then? That's 0.25 in front of my... It will compress because it's like, it will take this thing and it will shrink it down by a quarter. So I'm taking the top and I'm taking the bottom and I'm pushing it in by a quarter. We cool? So this, this A value acts just like what we are used to seeing. In fact, what would you say if I put a negative in front of there? What would happen if A were negative? What will it do? It will flip it, exactly, exactly. There we go. So it will basically take this guy and put him up here so your new graph will look like this. And I'll take this guy and put him down here, and so your new, new graph will look like that. We cool? It will take the original graph, and it will just go whoop, flip it upside down, across the y-axis. That's how. Well, that's what I mean by flip it. We cool? All right. Let's see if I can find some homework problem that's interesting. Nope, that's it. That's, that's all of rap two. We are done. Can I show you? Uh, well, I, I technically have 10 more, more minutes. Can I kind of show you where this is going to start coming down the pipeline? Oh, yeah. Hey, Bradley, get out of here. Go for it. Don't worry about it. It's your mom's birthday. All right. Anyway, I, I just kind of want to show you folks where this is kind of going to kind of kind of come into play. All right. Say that I want to graph something like um, x plus three over x. Let's see, squared 
plus 4x plus 3. Pretty cool? x plus 3 over x squared plus 4x plus 3. f of x. Here's the foreshadow of how we're going to use this. Got it? All right. I'm going to factor. Actually, let's not make it x plus 3. Let's make it x plus 2 over x plus all right, over x squared plus 4x plus 3. Okay. I'm going to factor the denominator. f of x equals x plus 2 over parentheses, parentheses, x, x, plus and plus, um, 1 and 3. We're cool with that? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll give you a second. Type this into Desmos. Type it into Desmos. Okay? All right. Here's my question to you. Where are the vertical asymptotes of this function right here? We, we basically say that the denominator cannot equal to 0. So x plus 1 times x plus 3 cannot equal to 0. We cool? And then, I know, I know it's a weird graph, but hold on. You're, we're basically saying that x cannot equal to 1 and x cannot equal to 3. Or, I'm sorry, negative 1 and negative 3. Are we cool with that? So, so... What we're saying here is on our graph, we're going to have a vertical asymptote at negative 1 and also at negative 3. All right. Um, there is one piece that I want to figure out is what is my... Actually, you know what? I, I hate to say this, but I'm actually pretty much, in this lecture right here, I'm pretty much going to show you um, what what RAT3 is all about. But it's actually really easy. So when you guys look at it, you're like, dang, that's really cool and easy. I love it. All right. Um, what is my y-intercept? And how do you find the y-intercept? Do you guys remember? By setting x equal to 0. I love that. Very good. So if I plug x equal to 0 into here, this is actually pretty easy. It's just um, f of 0 is equal to what? 2 thirds. Very good. So my y-intercept is at 2 thirds. So not exactly at 1, but 2 thirds. So like right about here. Cool? Cool. I'll tell you what, I already know what this graph looks like. What is my um, what is my x-intercept? How do I find that? I set y equal to 0, or in this case, I set f of x equal to 0, right? So this is equal to 0. So I have 0 equals x plus 2 over blah, blah, blah. We cool? But I can multiply both sides by blah, 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 and I end up getting 0 times blah, blah, blah is equal to x plus 2. But 0 times blah, blah, blah is 0. So really, I have 0 equals x plus 2. So x is equal to negative 2. Cool? Nothing, nothing that's too complicated. I just found my x and y intercepts. All right. I'll tell you what the graph looks like. I already know what the graph looks like. It looks something like this. Let me guess. I bet you it's going to be, since this is a vertical asymptote, it's going to go up to infinity this way, right? And then this thing probably is going to go this way, but it's not going to cross the y-axis or the, the 
x-axis again, because there's only one x-intercept. So if it crossed x-axis over here somewhere, then there would have to be another x-intercept, but I only calculated there'd be one of them. And then um, this thing is going to go up to infinity, but over here it's going to come down to infinity, and then it's going to go kind of like this. So almost like a negative cubic function over here. And then the last part of the graph is probably going to look something like that. Is that close to what you guys got? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I erased the denominator thing. I basically said this thing cannot equal to zero, and then we discovered that x cannot equal to 1 over 1 x equal to 3. Is this a piecewise function? No, it's not, actually. It's just a straight-up function. A piecewise function is a little bit different. Um, but I think that, remember, the goal that I was trying to basically tell you guys to do is I'm going to turn you guys into bad, bad mamma jammas who can um, graph things just by looking at them. And I think this we we are we have started to reach that point. Actually, we've been at that point for a while now, right? We've been able to graph parabolas like nobody's business. But look at this complicated as all heck graph. And I graphed and I figured it out. I didn't use no calculator. I didn't use a computer. I just kind of figured, ah, uh, well, there's got to be a vertical asymptote here, and there's got to be a vertical asymptote there, and then I, I know what my x and y intercepts are, and so I basically this must be what the graph looks like. Now, I'm sure that if you were to compare my graph to what the graph actually does look like, I bet you the graph actually does look something like this, and then maybe it looks something like this and this. So maybe my numbers aren't exactly the same as, as the actual graph. Maybe my graph won't overlap exactly with what the computer shows. But the, the idea is, is the picture is relatively the same. The, the, the properties of that graph are going to be the same. So if I wanted a super accurate graph, yes, I would use a computer. But if I want just, I want to get an idea and say, hmm, this has to be something close to what the answer is, then I would use this kind of stuff. And I think it's pretty awesome. I mean, the, the awesome thing is this. When you use a computer and you actually graph uh, things that are out in nature, you graph things as a scientist or an engineer or even like a, a market analyst or someone who likes to make money, you can look at it and say, huh, I think that graph is correct. Or, no, that graph is totally wrong. And then you go back and you check your work and you find out, oh, yeah, the computer made an error. What do you guys think? Is this cool? Not cool? I don't like it? Is it too hard? It's not really that hard. I mean, I don't really think it's that bad. But, all right. Then class is finished. You guys can get out of here. Kingston. Kingston Sato. You there? All right, cool. Um, we have physics. So I'm going to start a physics class right now, if that's all right with you. All right, for those of you math, math geeks, uh, Get out of here. Um, we, I'm canceling class on, on Monday, and I'll see you on Wednesday next week. All right. But Kingston, I'm going to see you in, a, in about two minutes.